Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and once again I am joined by... Uh, Drake NFL. <laughs> and so this is our second Q&A session, we're going to be looking at the questions that you asked below the... Uh, what was it? It was pretty much just Cruisers video, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, basically. Or Cruisers and Monitors, but yeah, Cruisers mm. essentially. Um, but before we do... Just a little bit of clarification, because I, I'm still getting comments on the first video, uh, be, because apparently um, people were hearing Archcast playing mm -hmm. over it. Uh, Drac, do you want to explain how this bizarre thing happened? Yeah, so I was obviously trying to think what the heck is going on, because... I'm sitting there going, well, I'm I, yeah, I'm not a rude and impolite person to suddenly, suddenly start watching other YouTube videos while we're talking. Apart from anything, I'm not that good at multitasking. Um, and I was thinking, of, you know, my phone was on silent. Um, obviously, I knew what the computer was doing. So, And then I, I went back and listened to the video. And I was like, oh, yeah, where, where the heck has this come from? Um and then I did some experiments with OBS, which is what this is being recorded in. And I think I figured out what the thing is, because at the moment, uh, the, the way we're recording it, I'm obviously speaking into my microphone. That's being picked up on the mic. And then uh, Venom here is obviously coming through my desktop audio. And that, so it's picking up that track. So that's his audio track. And while we were talking, I had some of the you know the sort of clip highlights etc videos and so forth that have the the models at both you know the, the the models they made for tng and some of the battle scenes from ds9 etc i had those up and running in the background just so i could reference them and make sure that i knew what when especially when we're talking about things like the cheyenne and the new york new orleans um exactly which models were which and i and obviously had those with the sound switched off for those videos but i also have autoplay turned on because you know if i'm just listening i don't want to have to click over to every video and i think what happened is because as some of you viewers may know i'm a huge 40k nerd as as well as a star trek nerd um i think what happened is that in the background somewhere i must have tabbed away from a star trek video and then obviously it was like, ah, oh, we would think that this would be of interest to you. So it, I guess it, it found a, a well-known 40K channel and went, okay, we're going to play this for you next. And uh, started playing it in the background, which then obviously because that's desktop audio, got recorded on OBS <laughs> um, for a, a few seconds, I think, before before it all um it all got cut off so yeah i think that's i think that's where that background came from yeah that's, uh, yeah we weren't we weren't subtly trying to uh plug for archcast <laughs> no i think we were trying to do that <laughs> no this is this is a wholly star trek based discussion <laughs> if yes. we if we wanted to do 40k we would do 40k ourselves <laughs> somewhere yeah. i don't know where but we yes. do it <laughs> do it somewhere We'll probably do it with Archcast. <laughs> true, yeah. We yeah. wanted to talk Battlefleet Gothic. Yes, that's true. Battlefleet Gothic. I I am well into my Battlefleet Gothic, but anyway, we are we are slightly skedaddling off the point. So yeah, we apologise yes. to anybody who randomly got other YouTube streams coming in. Um, it hopefully should not happen again. Um, we actually we actually we played we played around with it a bit after after when we saw these and we were discussing i was like ah oh, that's probably how it happened <laughs> yeah. anyway yeah and if it does happen again we all know who to blame yes it's me <laughs> <laughs> right okay so we'll jump right into the questions so first question from david plowman and this is regarding torpedoes and this is basically mm -hmm. Why do ships in Star Trek not? Why are they not simply festooned with with torpedo launchers? Right. Well, I, I think there's a few reasons, and probably you may agree or disagree. One of which is torpedoes are not speed of light weapons. And I mean, obviously, for the for the purposes of entertainment, neither are phasers or disruptors. <laughs> um, but they're near enough. 
Um, they're a lot, lot far. Put it this way: they're a lot faster. Whatever they are, they're a lot faster in their projection than a torpedo is. So it's much harder to dodge, and the weapon impact arrives a lot, lot quicker. Um, so with with a, with a torpedo, you can fire a torpedo, and someone can get out of the way. Uh, theoretically, with with some torpedoes at the speed some of them travel like um, i'm thinking in star trek 6 the the homing torpedo they rig up is kind of crawling through space uh fairly slowly yes. so, so for some ships might even be able to outrun those kinds of torpedoes and we do see people you know dodging and weaving theoretically torpedoes have homing devices but enough of them miss that either evasive action or electronic countermeasures or both obviously have some kind of effect so yeah, it, it's basically, I think it's easier to hit. Um, relatively speaking, you've also got a lot more ammunition because yes. your phases and disruptors, as long as, I guess, as long as you've got power, you can fire. <laughs> yes. Obviously, we know from DS9, they have things like phaser coils, etc. Or from Nemesis, there's presumably capacitor banks or something similar that can de be degraded. Um, but you can replace the phaser coils and your your capacitor banks can charge back up again. Whereas with torpedoes, once you fired off X number of torpedoes, that's it. Yes, I mean you get see you get some people arguing that um, you can replicate torpedoes, which if there's going to be any kind of sensible balance in the Star Trek universe, mm. I don't think is right. I don't think you can just replicate complex things like photon torpedoes or, or phaser rifles yeah well, i mean that, that. and to be honest even if you could i think that the, the replicator is either going to need energy or um mass or matter to reconfigure depending on which particular um show we're talking about so you're either going to have to be carrying the approximately equivalent mass anyway to be reconfigured into torpedoes and then you've introduced another point of failure because um if you're carrying like i don't know six torpedoes and a torpedo replicator and then somebody shoots you and your torpedo replicator goes offline yes well here's the other thing is also the more torpedo launches you have the more vulnerabilities mm -hmm. you have. like you have because then you have to feed those launches and the more launches you have across your surface you can't then have just a central magazine which is made very safe like for example the akira and people were back <clears> we didn't mention the akira but it has a torpedo pod on top and that's basically the majority yes it has torpedoes and the saucer as well but the majority of its torpedoes are there and that's a very heavily protected part of the ship that would be very heavily armored and reinforced because it's a very obvious target Whereas if you're having to protect your entire ship, which is covered in torpedo launchers, it's a bit of an uphill battle. Yeah, and I think the the other thing is, at least in some elements of canon, I, I think it's alpha canon. It may also be beta canon, or it may may just be beta. Um, the the torpedoes have to draw on, for their at least we're talking when we talk about photon torpedoes, they have to draw their antimatter. For the warheads from the overall um, antimatter supply that the ship has as fuel, if I remember correctly, um, which makes sense to a certain degree because the I can't imagine the health and safety nightmare that would be stocking, yeah, you know, several hundred. I mean, how many does a galaxy carry? Several hundred. <laughs> Yes, I mean, several hundred lump, clumps of antimatter sitting in a in a in, in just a, a what's got to be a relatively close to the surface area. That's just begging for your ship to be atomized. So, you know, drawing on this central core of antimatter, which can be heavily protected, makes an awful lot of sense. But it means that for every torpedo you fire, I mean, it would be like having a car with a flamethrower that's connected to the petrol tank. So every every time you fire the weapon, you are slightly depleting your total range, which you know, for, yeah, for a ship for a six hundred meter plus long galaxy, with a few hundred torpedoes and each torpedo maybe carrying a kilo or two of antimatter, probably doesn't make much odds. But if you're so going, yeah, or if you're going for a, like some people suggest, just cover everything so you have thousands of torpedoes, um, you could find yourself out of fuel and therefore out of power pretty darn fast. 
Yes, exactly what I've just I've just sent you. That yeah. I shared to my I found that on I think Track Yard's Facebook group. Yeah. A heavily overblown and ruined Andor <laughs> Mark Two. Oh boy, it that thing's going to be. It didn't have enough. It doesn't have enough torpedoes and mega phases and antennas and mm. things. That's Come just. On. That's basically just going to be chugging through space incredibly slowly. Yeah, well, the moment it it fires like a full salvo, mm. it's going to deplete from fuel. The other thing I, I'd also say is that, depending on your approach to torpedo mm. launchers, uh, it partially depends on scale. So. Torpedo launchers very early on, particularly mm -hmm. talking TOS era, or even Enterprise, also in Enterprise, but they're relatively low acceleration because there's a relatively proportional small amount of space between where the torpedo is loaded and the tube. Yeah. So it doesn't have much time to accelerate. You compare that to Klingon style torpedo launcher mm -hmm. around which the ship was built, and it's basically a small rail gun. Yeah. Not quite that kind of velocity but you know build that kind of acceleration and that would give them the power to strike further so one of the reasons the klingons aren't festooning their ships with torpedo launchers is because it's not about having lots of torpedo launchers it's about having a torpedo launcher that can reach out further than the other guys yeah and i think the the other thing to bear in mind when it comes to torpedoes as as your primary weapon and this is this is a bit of personal head cannon, although I I think it's relatively well supported in the show, at least by the visuals. Is I I get the feeling that torpedoes are more effective against hull, and yes. phasers are more effective against shields, or you know whatever energy weapon of choice. Because when you see a an energy weapon firing against a shielded starship, the there, there's not really much energy blowback. The energy is presumably, therefore, just being dumped purely into the shields. So, I mean, nothing's perfect, but you're, let's say you've got 99% energy transfer, so that's fairly good at wickering away at your shields. Whereas if you see any torpedo detonation, there's always a, a big gout of flame, mysteriously, because apparently there's oxygen in space, who knew? Yes. Um, but, you know, there, there's a big energy burst of some description that comes off the shields when the torpedo explodes, which means that even in an absolutely perfect world, at least 50% of the energy from that torpedo detonation is being wasted into open space. Um, yes. Possibly more no, if the shield has any kind of reflective quality, so it's a less efficient method, but once the shields are down... Yeah. A torpedo that punches into the hull and then detonates, as we you know we've seen them do multiple times when there's been duds, then that 360 degree explosion is actually going to be much more effective at tearing apart a massive chunk of the ship rather than just you know drilling a phaser-sized hole through something. Would say um, your head cannon probably conflicts a little bit with mm. the kind of what has become the the venom. Verse, yes. Uh, in as much as I, I describe how basically, initially, yeah, you do have that problem mm. with early photon torpedoes, mm. for like probably most of twenty second, early twenty third century, and then by the late twenty third century, and this is why the Klingons are using them so heavily in the movies, mm. is they have like basically a torpedo heat star warhead, so it channel it like deliberately channels all the uh, energy into the ship's shields. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, yeah, you might say that's a special type of ammunition, and it's still not necessarily going to be as effective as a phaser. I mean, for starters, yeah. you can keep up a much more heavy phaser or disruptor barrage than you can with just a single torpedo. Yeah, and I think you've, you've, um, I mean, yeah, things like, let's say, a shaped charge warhead in the modern times where most of the energy can be directed forward i suppose you probably could say you have a someone has invented the equivalent of a shape charge warhead for antimatter weapons which would improve the capabilities of a torpedo against shields but you're still apart you've still got the fact it's a um even in that kind of circumstance you've got a relatively speaking large surface area over which that energy is being projected even if it's only a yes. couple of square meters whereas a phaser or a disruptor theoretically is you know down to maybe a, a few dozen square centimeters which again for punching through or draining shields would probably be a more effective weapon 
Yes, yes. I, I would definitely agree with that. Mm. And actually, with, with what you said about shields versus torpedoes and, mm. and uh, energy weapons, I, again, that actually, that does actually conform to what I've kind of said about the pre, pre-human pre sort of galaxy when I described, mm-hmm. like, the... Uh, 22nd century or 21st, 22nd century between like the Klingons and the Orions and that whole beta quadrant situation where the whole definitive thing is you have shields that are very finicky and not that reliable and drain very quickly if they're hit with energy weapons but you also have ships with very strong hull armor like the Orion pirate ship which is you know hilariously upscaled in STO but mm. you know, it, it does look very heavily armored and that would, and that's going to disperse the blast from the energy weapon. So you're pl- sort of playing a sort of a game of red light, green light, trying to get the enemy to raise their shields so you can drain them, or you know keep their shields down so you can fire a torpedo and break their armor. Yeah, and I think I think this also kind of bears out in when we see the visuals in the various shows. Admittedly, there is a bit of crossover. Sometimes someone will be hit by a phaser blast or whatever, and it, everything explodes. Um, like, what was it? The Lantry Miranda that just got one-shotted by the Enterprise D. Um, but I think, by and large, when especially when you get the dialogue of combat, if somebody wants someone disabled, which, let's face it, the Federation usually does, um, when the security officer says, you know, their shields are down... If the captain wants engines, weapons, sensors, whatever, disabled or destroyed, they're always targeting it with phasers. Yes. Whereas the, 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 the times where they really want something gone, they usually follow up a phaser barrage that drops their shields with a barrage of torpedoes, and then that's it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the only kind of, again, exception um, that I can think of, mm. of an energy weapon being used to just obliterate a ship was the in redemption where the bortas comes under attack mm. and Worf waits for them to the bird of prey which is a cavour class bird of prey it's not an insubstantial ship um and they wait for it to lower its shields to beam aboard and then they fire a, a disruptor blast and they do say disruptors yes even though it is a sort of ball effect so maybe you think they were mm. actually going for a torpedo but it kind of works in that instance because as I've said before, with the Vodcha, that whole thing, at the, that module at the front of a ship, is a giant gun. Yeah. Like, so so it probably could do that. Yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, even even with an energy weapon, if you target somewhere that's you know nice and explosive, like the antimatter fuel stocks or something, or or a plasma con or a particularly large plasma conduit, you probably can cause huge damage. But with with directed energy weapons, but it's going to be a little bit more hit and miss. And then, of course, you have the things that are horrifically, with there's a horrific overmatch, um, like at the the end of DS Nine when the Cardassians switch sides. You know, there's a Jemadar fight. Jemadar fight is getting completely obliterated by the main uh, disruptor beam from a uh, Galore. Okay. But yeah. given the size discrepancy, that's not exactly surprising. And then you said, yeah. see the sacrifice of angels when the two galaxies just blow past. Well, ironically enough, another mm-hmm. galore. Um, they, yeah, they're just using energy weapons, but notably, you know, the galore doesn't explode. It's physically shoved yeah. aside by the energy that's being dumped into yeah. it, but it doesn't blow up. Yes, I mean, actually, speaking of sacrifice of angels, mm-hmm. the second question he asked is why are there no torpedo armed fighters? To which I would actually say, David. There are specifically the Peregrine. Um, they they describe it in dialogue as having torpedoes, at least when it's used by the Marquis. Mm. In that episode, they fire the torpedoes from the nose, with, where it's got a, like a little turret, which doesn't make any sense. I've, 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 at this point, I've done a video about the Peregrine fighter, sort of uh, responding to Law Reloaded, mm. but just to reiterate it here, that doesn't make much sense. What I have seen make more sense is it carrying uh, like underwing torpedoes like a modern fighter and it could carry about six which is the amount it would take to drop the shields of a constitution back in the 23rd century so it's not an insubstantial amount of torpedo firepower the issue you have with these kind of torpedoes is they're not accelerated you're just kind of dropping them and just letting them glide to 
um, the target mm. on their own power systems. And as previously mentioned, with like how torpedo launchers sort of developed, you know, that kind of limits them in terms of range and means they're more likely to be evaded. Yeah. Um, so, next question is from Timothy Chapman. Um, and he asks if I, if the thing he's specifically asking me, maybe you have an opinion, mm -hmm. uh, whether I can do a series on other interpretations of off screen events and the example he gives of the Romulan War. So, just to be clear, I've done a, a full series on the Romulan mm -hmm. Earth War, which is like a weird hodgepodge of Enterprise and Starfleet Museum. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a bit weird, but it's got a charm, I think. And then I did a little video a while back talking about specifically purely Starfleet Museum's um, Romulan War, which is a very different... I don't know if you kind of know, know of that. Yes. I mean, I'm, I off and on um, have gone through various elements of the of the Starfleet Museum webpage and the I, I mean I I like the amount of effort and work they put into the um into the Earth Romulan War albeit I do sometimes refer to it as the, the war of cylinders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but um yeah I I must admit actually personally I it did it it was something that I always struggled to get my head around fully. It's kind of I'd come to it and read a section and be like, okay, right, I, I, enough, enough for one day. Then I'd come back and <laughs> read another bit and so on and so forth. Yes, I mean, I, th I think it's a very, yeah, really interesting, and it's it's kind of much like a lot of the stuff I do. It's a very well thought out universe. He's got mm. it all thought out. He has his system in place, um, and it is a very diff interesting interpretation. But ultimately, it's a descendant of original series. That's kind of his express. Uh, motive when he's when he's written that is he wants to be more in the spirit of original series so he can make it feel like a genuine pre you know prequel to original series as compared to Enterprise which is taking a lot more inspiration from Next Generation. Yes, and I mean it is one of the it is one of the problems with prequel era Trek. I think is. It, it, it's it's getting ever more kept closely sliced. So you had where where I mean certainly when the Starfleet Museum webpage started up, I remember reading it when I was in my early teens. Um, back in the good old days, we had to do fifty six k dial up. Um, <laughs> but um, no, it's, but back when they were initially doing the the, the foundation work for for all of it. At that point, the only stuff we had between the modern day space program and TOS was vague references from TOS and TNG. So to start from Star Trek timeline, 23rd century onwards, at which point, you know, all, all, I mean, what did we really know? What what existed pre-Constitution? We had the, so the XCV-330 from one of the movies, the, the, uh, the ring ship. The 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 one that's got like the the ring the the twin warp ring. rings with yeah. a spindle yeah. in the middle. So we had that out of one of I think Star Trek, the the one the movie, and we had the Daedalus um, class. We had the Daedalus class from somewhere, and we had the SS Valiant from when which theoretically went over the edge of the galaxy and gave everybody superpowers. Um, <laughs> And and you kind of had to try and vaguely fit those. Oh, and I think I, I suppose at that point the Grissom, the Oberth, was a, a triple digit NCC reg, which suggested it was older than the Enterprise. And and that was really all you had. You had yeah. the, these these are kind of what three or four ships, and a few vague references, and that was all you had to populate everything from yes. t early 21st century to the 23rd century and if the Daedalus were, was kind of a immediately immediate predecessor to uh, the the constitution class which you could kind of see you kind of had to walk it back for the timeline where they talked about the earth the, the earth Roman war you had to walk it back at least another generation of ship design or two 
and then look to and then from there you're kind of looking okay for, from the 21st century how do we get to this point i don't think at that point we even had first contact so we didn't even really know what um the phoenix looked like no yeah i, I think you're right because again he has his own um warp prototype i think it's called is it, what's it called um, just on the site now mm. Called the is it Little Nelly? Yeah, yeah something like that. Uh, Little Nell. Yeah. Which I would, you know, and I, I appreciate those sort of um, that kind of character to it as well, in terms of calling it Little yeah. Nell, a bit of a reference to Little Willie, sort of thing. Mm. Like there's there's really nice details and and. Um, yeah, you know its own its own universe. Yeah, and this is the thing: it's it, as a universe, you can see how, with the stuff that he had available to him at the time, it actually fits really well. And then you've got Enterprise coming along and kind of putting putting the uh, the the level of almost making the Federation or uh, initially the Earth considerably more advanced, considerably earlier than you would otherwise have thought. Uh, yeah. It becomes very it, difficult it, to square the Daedalus with the NX01. <laughs> yes. Well, I think ultimately all the what the fan films were going mm. for is that the Daedalus is actually an older ship, sort of put yeah. back into service for the war. Yes. But then, you know, and then you get ships that kind of lead more into the 23rd century. So, like in Star Trek Beyond, you get mm. the Franklin, which, which was actually really, really nice. Like, yeah. I really like the design, but it looks more advanced, even though it's mm. like a precursor to the nx yeah it can't be it's probably not by that much and um i've seen some people like use it in star trek online with um like a tos style skin yeah and it fits yes really nicely and kind of the, the the issue now is because you kind of just hey the starfleet museum okay that's off in it's in its own universe because it's very distinct mm. it's got its own set of rules that it's playing yeah by. the real issue becomes with the various interpretations of like a TOS era Klingon war. Mm. You've got Fassa, you've got Axanar, you've got um, Starfleet Battles, mm -hmm. you've got Discovery, all of which are kind of playing in the same sandpit. Mm. You know, it's, it's the same sandbox of stuff and they're putting it together in different ways and it's like, oh, well, I like this from, from this. You know, maybe I yeah. like a kind of a TOSified uh, Nimitz class, say. Yeah. Oh, but I also like the Ares from Axanar. You know, what fits, what makes sense, and what you know, what stays, what goes. Yeah, it, it, it's it's one of the one of the weird things I've always found actually about that era is that the various Beta Cannon and Fanon concepts for the 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 um, Federation Klingon War are actually. Well, obviously, they're all their own things. They're actually a lot more coherent put together than Discovery is. <laughs> Discovery yes. just went off on a complete weird one. I was just, you know, I must like as a Star Trek fan, when you had the Battle of the Binary Stars, um, you know, I, I'm usually almost religious about making sure I don't get spoilers. So I went into it not knowing anything. I was like, okay, Beacon old cultural thing you know can look very weird it's you know it's a it's as much a cultural religious object as it is a active space beacon so you can forgive the the spiky greebly bits um yeah and then what was it the the, the big ship um not the not the cleave ship the sarcophagus. the sarcophagus ship yeah i was looking at it and i was like okay well if it's kind of it's if it's paired with this beacon there's a certain element of design continuity in that. And again, if it's more of a mobile shrine dash religious yeah. object, it, it's not well, quite in keeping. Colony, yeah. yeah, it's not quite in keeping with the either the TOS or TNG DS9 Klingon aesthetic. But I can you, you can forgive it to a degree because it's not of the the military style yes. that, that you, you, you would expect. And then this complete hodgepodge of what concept looks art. yeah not not even concept art to be honest to, if i'm being completely blunt it to me it looked a bit like um a, a slightly over -ambitious, ambitious version of like shadow the hedgehog in space 
uh, it's, it's literally if you took shadow the hedgehog put him through a, a severe amount of depression blew him up and reassembled him in space in various interesting ways that's pretty much how you end up with most of the klingon designs for discovery it, it, it i was looking at uh, did the klingons like murder another race and steal all their ships and they use them as like yeah. expendable kamikazes i mean it would be the kind of thing the klingons would do but <laughs> yeah yeah well it's, and especially when it contrasts with a Federation fleet, which, okay, isn't pre-TOS, it's more like a kind of revamped motion picture. Yeah, which, I mean, to be fair, to a certain degree is, I know people didn't, some people didn't like them, but to a, I, I like the TOS aesthetic, but to a certain degree, I can kind of see why they went with that. I mean, we do have the whole thing from Gene Roddenberry stating that the, technically speaking, I think he, want, he wanted it to be that the Enterprise we saw in uh, and in the first in the motion picture on Wrath of Khan was always how the Enterprise had looked and that the, the TOS Enterprise was kind of well obviously it was because of budgetary reasons <laughs> when they filmed the original yeah. series but he was like oh well that's just that's just a representation from some like in period documentary but this is at what it actually looks like yes um, i mean you can kind of you can kind of see it when it's if you go back and look at the original original series mm, before it was remastered yeah and i'm pretty sure the enterprise does look like this uh, vague shape yeah um as compared to when they mm. you know remastered it and got a lovely yeah. model and it has become its own distinct aesthetic with its yes. own fans i mean i was i was doing a shoot um yesterday on mm -hmm. Star Trek Online with TOS era ships and the thing about them is they just look good under pretty much any lighting because they're so color neutral yeah they're all basically white and light gray you know yeah so, I, I I mean I really do like the TOS aesthetic I like the 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 sort of the Enterprise A if you could like want to call it that the reconstitution refit aesthetic as well but they're, they're actually both really good aesthetics <laughs> yeah, and and they're kind of they're separate, and they're a nice way of sort of, um, yeah, delineating the different eras. Whereas, kind of, yeah, almost what you've seen sort of since Enterprise, and then I would say Strange New Worlds kind of mm. picks up on it, is that kind of TNGification. Is yes, that, you know, you've got to have the red facades and the and the mm. blue grills, and you know, I. I appreciate that in terms of trying to lend consistency to the universe. Mm. I can understand why you do that. But at the same time, it does kind of take away... It gives you it gives you less you can do rather yeah. than kind of crafting a different aesthetic for different eras. Yeah, and I mean, I, obviously, I appreciate that the, the showrunners did kind of take a lot of that feedback on board because we weren't exactly alone in thinking that the Klingon aesthetic was a yeah. bit rubbish. Um, and it was quite funny to see just how desperately they were rowing back on that, because then, of course, I think it was season two of Discovery, you get this whole, like, we have united all the house's design principles and this will be our new battle cruiser, which is the D7, basically. D7. And But as like, on the one hand, kudos for trying to desperately get everything back on track to something resembling something that most of the fans will accept. Mm. On the other hand, it was kind of... It was so. It, the thing that amused me the most was looking back at all the Klingon designs in season one of Discovery, and just how utterly different the D seven is. Yeah. I was looking at it going. You could imagine a bunch of Klingon houses going. Where the heck did that come from? <laughs> it's like you've united all of our design aesthetics and apparently thrown them all in the bin, which, to be fair, is where they belong, <laughs> and then just drawn something that's like a sixteen polygon attack ship. It's like okay, I um, I guess. Yeah. Yes, we have we have yeah gone and looked into an ancient Earth arcade machine. Yeah. Out. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose the the only other thing, the only other way you, I guess, you could probably justify it from a from a Klingon perspective would be, and I know this is really reaching, but it's just a bit of fun to speculate on. Would be that um, because I, I think the sort of the, the retroactive canon that we were given was that the the season one discovery was basically all the independent Klingon houses with their own fleets and their own individual design styles and so forth, uh, if I remember reading correctly. Yeah. And I suppose at that point, you could, if you made a really long, stretchy argument, 
you could argue that maybe the Klingons somehow, despite being Klingons, had been at peace for so long that they kind of had the, maybe this core underlying architecture, which when it's stripped back is basically gives you something that looks vaguely like a D7 um, or similar. Yeah. Um, and then over time, this had become overlaid with lots of little greebly showy offy bits, which was the only way they could distinguish themselves from other houses. Which So a lot of the exterior stuff was more of an aesthetic design choice. You know, kind of like um, if you, like someone someone with a tricked out Cadillac with lots of little wings and spoilers yes. and spinners and and all sorts that make it look really fancy. But then if you actually strip them all down, you've got a relatively plain looking car, <laughs> which yeah. I suppose you you could make an argument for. But then at the same time, the idea of, of somehow a the klingons ending up at peace long enough for this to become a thing and then b deciding instead of having a big fight over whose ships was best they decided the best way was basically to turn themselves into the space peacocks except with spikes yeah, <laughs> yeah which is you know yeah that's not a very klingon thing to do i mean my <laughs> explanation was that these were just really 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 ancient ships from like the early days of klingon warp flight so they mm. had to be like colony ships then you are on into the fact that they're beating 23rd century Starfleet ships and that yes. sort of falls apart a little bit. So you kind of just have to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, then again, to be to be fair, most of the Starfleet captains and admirals in Season 1 of Discovery appeared to have maybe one functioning brain cell between them. Yes, <laughs> so well, they appear to be... It, it's another thing that kind of annoyed me, and, or a little bit, it's not colossally but again that they're all the star view of season one and this is getting mm. very nitpicky seems to be again in that same place as next generation yeah so uh, it makes a lot of sense because it from what well like what you're saying obviously not discovery's attitude because you know they've gone from being the earth military um with you know klingons and vulcans and andorans and tellarites and everything which is basically what we see in enterprise and they are somewhat exploratory there but let's they also have make Ma macos or makos or whatever you want to call them um aboard and reed who just you know wants to blow everything up yes. <laughs> so and and then as you say yeah, you've got the romulan war the, the federation to be i mean to be fair the federation is in in a lot of ways i guess like nato it's forged its origins are forged in the fires of a conflict um, Absolutely. and we know that the the both the andorians and the vulcans even at this point and the tellarites they were all actually considerably more aggressive even than the human starfleet was mm. and they've all been integrated in we know that you know, the vulcans for example have considerably longer lifespans than humans i don't know exactly what the canon status of the andorians and the tellarites is but i think the andorians have a slightly longer lifespan than humans as well though not as much as the vulcans um here, here. Just, just a yeah. tripping point because Andorians have faster metabolisms than humans. That's a yeah. reference. I think it would make more sense if they're actually shorter than humans. Yeah, I mean, it could make. I could be misremembering, but the the thing is, as you said, like the Romulan War would have been within living memory of some humans, easily within living memory of of Vulcans. I mean, there'd probably be Vulcans. Uh, although Missy Spock is supposed to be the first Vulcan in Starfleet, but there would be Vulcans with active military service in the Romulan War who would still be active in whatever service they were in. Um, the idea that somehow Starfleet... Well, and they would have run into the Klingons in, in, in the Enterprise era. So the idea that Starfleet has somehow just kind of radically downshifted itself into, as you say, an, an almost TNG-like status doesn't that that doesn't make much sense they're, they're still in ex, very much an expanding and relatively small political entity at this point they, they should yeah. be a lot more and, and you know in tos there are a lot more i mean okay they're out there to explore but they're a lot more militaristic uh, in both yeah. tos and the movies than you see in in discovery Yes, I mean, another thing, again, this is a minor detail, and I realise we are really overcompensating with <laughs> Tim's question. Oh, well. <laughs> but um, I'm sure he won't like, complain. Uh, no, I'm sure he won't. In, in, again, in Discovery, there's 
presented a hard border between Klingon Empire and the Federation. And hard borders in space, yeah, they're useful to visualize things, and you hmm. can maybe make more of an argument by the 24th century. But the impression we get from TOS is basically you have the Federation over here and the Klingon Empire way over here, and in between these two powers is this big swath of frontier mm -hmm. which doesn't really concretely belong to either side and they all have different claims competing claims in this area and they're vying for influence here yeah which i, I suppose was probably their way of trying to walk back the the very narrow border conflicts and skirmishes that you had in tos to a sort of to winding it back a little bit to maybe say all oh, the borders haven't quite met up yet but oh, no, sorry, that was I was saying in in Discovery they have yeah. a hard border. Oh right, okay. And it, you know, and, but in, as it's presented in TOS, it feels like there's actually just a big frontier. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, which is, I mean, that fits with the of TOS being modelled on the Cold War. So these are the these border sort of border planets are kind of they're the equivalent of the third world countries that the US and USSR was vying for at the time TOS was in production. Yeah. Um, yes, and there's some very not subtle metaphors and stories to that. Effect. Yes, yeah. So I mean, yeah, it's I, I I don't know. Season one of Discovery, to be honest, is a bit of a mess. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, this is why they've gone to the future. Yes, and, and you know, and that's often it's its own thing. Um, yeah. So yes. Uh, so I think we should, I think we've come so, somewhere in the past twenty minutes or so we may have come somewhere close to an answer to what he actually originally asked. 